All right, so um, you have probably heard this first part before, um, but bear with me. Good afternoon, and welcome to Developing Payment Reform Strategy Through Data and Payment Model Incentives, presented jointly by the Alliance for Home Health Quality and Innovation and the Visiting Nurse Associations of America. This session is being recorded. This continuing nurse education activity has been approved for one contact hour by the Maryland Nurses Association and an accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. In order to receive your certificate of completion, you will need to attend this program in its entirety and complete the evaluation available on the conference app. Certificates of completion are available at the registration desk. Our faculty has disclosed no financial conflict of interest. A copy of the full disclosure sheet is available at the table outside the room. And I'd like to now introduce today's presenters. Patrick Brown is the Vice President for Finance at Trinity Health at Home, a multi-state home health and hospice agency. Patrick has worked in home health and hospice for 23 years and has been the senior finance executive at each agency he has worked for the past 18 years. Patrick is a member of the board of directors for the Visiting Nurse Association of America and has been active in the Home Health Financial Managers Association work group for the past six years. Paul Giles has been the chief financial officer in home care during the past 38 years with a total experience in home care finance and operations for over 41 years. His current responsibilities include assistance in financial oversight and operations within all Dignity Health home care locations in collaboration with home care and hospital management. Mr. Giles has expensive, if not extensive, experience. <laughs> within the areas of home care information systems, Medicare, Medicaid, home health and hospice reimbursement and managed care. Mark Sharp is BKD's home health, I'm sorry, home care and hospice center of excellence coordinator and has more than 25 years of experience assisting home care and hospice providers with audits, strategic planning, accounting, cost reports, projections, operating budgets, corporate integrity, agency startup and mergers and acquisitions. Mark frequently presents workshops on various home care and hospice topics at national, regional, and state home care and hospice conferences throughout the United States. He has written numerous articles in healthcare periodicals and is routinely quoted in home care and hospice newsletters. The only bit of housekeeping I'll do before I hand it over to the gentleman is to let you know I'm gonna send around the sheet for everyone to sign so you can get your credit. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Uh, she's got a great dry sense of humor. But uh, I was uh, leaning over to Paul and I said, Paul, Aren't you to the point where you just say over 25 years? Um, there's no reason to be specific. Huh? So uh, you can just let the people guess a little bit more. Hope everybody's having a great conference. We have a lot of content that we want to cover for you all this afternoon. So we're going to go through it pretty quickly. And we also want to ask you, I don't tend to like to do this because I like to take questions as we go. I'm going to ask you, unfortunately, to hold the questions until the end, and uh, we'll take them. And all three of us have said uh, there's so we, we have so much content that we're probably going to take a lot of the session. So we'll stay as long as you want to talk about questions afterwards. Uh, we know, though, that we're the only thing uh, between you and a drink. So uh, we'll we'll try to keep it uh, as quick as we can. Well. What we wanted to talk about, and as we thought about this session, is we wanted to talk about everything that you all are dealing in payment reform, but try to relay what we feel like is very, very important as you as leaders are trying to work in an industry, home care and hospice, that is really being tasked to try to step up to the plate and become collaborators with the rest of the continuum. It's so important. And anytime you think about collaboration, it's so important that you also understand what is important to the people you're trying to collaborate with. So what we're gonna cover um, is we're gonna try to talk about, number one, I'm gonna provide an overview of the landscape that you're currently dealing with with existing payment models, but also the evolving payment landscape. Then I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick, and he's gonna talk about how they've used data 
in his organization to drive the strategy. You've heard over and over at this conference how important data, how important data is. And it's absolutely critical. You've got to build out your value proposition. And you've got to have the data to build out your strategy. Lastly, we're going to turn it over to Paul. Paul's going to talk about how they use in their system knowledge of the incentives of the different payment models, the incentives for the hospitals within their payment models, incentives of the SNFs within their own payment models to drive the strategy in their organization. That's what we want to try to accomplish over the next hour, so hopefully uh, we'll get there. As I said, what we're going to start off with first is understanding the current payment models that we're in today. And this is going to be extremely elementary here, but when we start with the existing payment models, what I want to try to convey to you all is you can't just understand your payment world in home health or in hospice. As a leader, you've got to understand the current payment models and the future payment models for that matter of all of the other healthcare provider types as well. So you start with hospitals. They're paid, they've been paid for over 30 years now on a DRG basis. What is the natural incentive with DRGs? They get one payment for the full length of stay. Get them out the door. So what did they do on the flip side? What have they done over the last five years? They've added a rehospitalization component, penalty. Because if it's their goal to kick them out the door as quick as possible, then they need to make sure they're not getting readmitted because they're kicking them out too soon. But you need to understand that dynamic, and, and it's pretty much a given, but, and we're staying at a very high level, but how can you help them accomplish that incentive or help them meet their goals with the incentives that drive them? Then everybody is getting hit with value-based purchasing. Hospitals have had it since 2013. It's not going away. But, so we need to understand, what are the value drivers for hospitals? How are you going to help them meet those value drivers? Physicians, they're paid on a fee schedule. So what is their uh, incentive, their natural incentive? It's to do as many visits in a day as they can possibly do. Chuck out those visits. That's their natural incentive. They also have a value-based purchasing model. Let me just ask, fee-for-service, does it naturally reduce the uh, the incentive to reduce visits or encounters or increase them. Increase them, clearly. So you almost have hospitals in a different world than you have the physicians. Now let's talk about the SNFs. They're under, and they have been since 2000, basically, the RUGS, resource utilization groups. They get paid on a per day basis. What's the natural incentive there? It's to keep them in their facility as long as they can completely counterintuitive to what we're trying to do in healthcare in reducing cost. They, like the physicians, like the hospitals, have the value-based purchasing component as well. So the big takeaway here is I can't spend five minutes telling you how they're currently paid and really do it justice. The important takeaway is there are different incentives for all of these. And it is critical that as leaders of your agencies that you understand those payment models. So now let's talk about where we are today versus where we want to go. With ACA, they laid out a game plan and introduced the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And they went from when they initially formed CMMI of having payments in fee-for-service, how we're currently paid, of 100% of the way healthcare providers are being paid. The goal was to get them to 30% into alternative payment models by last year. They have accomplished that. They want to get there at 50-50 mix by 2018. 
and they're headed towards that goal. So we definitely are in a evolving payment landscape. But we have to deal on both sides. We have to have a foot on both sides of the fence. Here are all the different alternative payment models that CMMI has, has put out there. It starts with some of the things we've known for years. A, 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 a affordable care organizations, excuse me, accountable care organizations, ACOs. That ACOs are about total population health. Taking a patient uh, population and being hitting the triple aim, and that's the focus in all of this, with entire total population health. Then you look at the second bucket. The second bucket are what we call episode payment models or bundled payment for care improvement models. The first four models that they put out there were voluntary models. Models two and model three, were both, both of those involved post-acute and were what we call retrospective models. And we'll talk about that further a little bit. Then you have four other classifications. Primary care was all about trying to build that medical home that you all have heard about. The Medicaid and CHIP, it's about uh, broadening the Medicaid and state programs that are out there for those low income healthcare who tend to be the higher cost beneficiaries out there. So uh, ways to try to hit the triple aim with that population. Acceleration models. Acceleration models are tr using regional emphasis or state emphasis or other payers to try to accelerate outside of Medicare's landscape these new alternative payment models. And then you have the speed up of the adoption of best practices. They say it takes 17 years to get best practices to become industry standards. 17 years. This effort is to try to accelerate that process. So those are everything that they're throwing out there right now. Some might say the new administration wants to do a CMMI. The new administration is against regulatory activity. They're, they're all Republicans. You think of, they want less legislation. They want to privatize things. So is everything that I'm talking about in Medicare all for naught? I would suggest that not to be true. Because whether it's Medicare or the other payers, alternative payment models, a shift from fee for service to fee for value is the way it's headed. And we've got to be there. And we've got to understand that. CMMI listed all their accomplishments back in December, shortly after the election of Trump. Timing was interesting there to kind of show what they've accomplished. They've launched over 30 new payment models in six years. They've estimated 18 million patients are impacted or received care through those payment models. Uh, we already talked about the shift to 30% of the models to a alternative payment model approach. They partnered not only with Medicare, but Medicaid and other commercial payers. Again, it's not all about Medicare here. And they've gotten state programs such as Vermont, all payers starting in January 2017 in Vermont are focused in an alternative value-based payment model. And we're scared to death. And you're scared to death, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I'll be curious how that goes. And what probably the biggest thing out there is they suggest a 34 billion spending reduction per the CBO in what they've done. This is not going away. If you don't think that you're impacted by this, look at this map. Yeah, if you're in Wyoming or South Dakota, it's possible you might not be, but you look ar around the rest of the country, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. Here's what I would tell you. Where would I put my chips on the table with what's gonna happen, where you're gonna be most affected? BKD, myself, we would put our money into the bundles. We think that the bundles, what those are all about, is a spe specific healthcare event or condition and building a limited time payment around that event. 
Do we think ACOs are going away? No. But are they going to be the predominant uh, model out there? Probably not. Uh, we thought a HMOs back in the 1990s would become that. They didn't. And I'm here to suggest ACOs probably are not either. We believe, and you even look at the popularity of the bundles. They're the ones in the middle. It's kind of hard for you to read. This a small chart. But there is a lot more participation in the bundles as well as there are the first mandatory programs for an alternative payment model under bundles. And that comes with CJR and the upcoming uh, cardiac rehab. So again, I would place my, my, my bet that this is where we're gonna be living more often than not as we get more alternative models penetrating our markets. So let's just talk about real quickly what is an alternative payment model in the bundled world? How is it designed? CJR is a good example to go by. This CJR started back in, a, almost a year ago, a little over a year ago, I should say, for 67 MSAs. The first, what I would suggest, mandatory alternative payment model. You might say, well, Mark, there were some, there were some value-based purchasing models out there. Um, yes, that's true. But when you think about a, a mandatory payment model out there under the alternative payment models, this is one of the first. So it's all about lower extremity joint replacement. I'm probably telling you the, the knowns about this, DRGs 469, 470. It starts with a hospital anchor stay, and it goes 90 days post-discharge. So the hospital admission with the the uh, treatment, the surgery, and then 90 days past that. It is a retrospective model. What do I mean re by retrospective? All the providers, including the hospital themselves, continue to get paid fee for service under this model. Home health, you get your 60 day episodes. Uh, SNFs get their rubs. But what they do is they look at the total expense, excuse me, Medicare outlays for the entire 90-day episode plus the original anchor stay. And they take the averages and they set a target spending for those episodes. If the, the total spending for the hospital on average is above the price target, then the hospital is going to owe back. If they're below, the hospital is going to get some shared savings out of it from Medicare. They have value-based components of it as well. Almost everything you see in APMs is going to have a value-based component in it. So the critical part of this is collaboration. And that's where when you have to collaborate, you've got to understand how everybody is affected under this payment model. The question is, what's next? Again, we put our money on, on the bundles. They might go from uh, 67 MSAs to all MSAs. They're, we already know they're going to cardiac rehab. Will they go to COPD, CHF? What will that look like? Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about MCCM, Medicare Care Choices, for uh, hospice, but the one thing, the takeaway here, is this is setting up a per member, per beneficiary, per month payment to introdu introduce something that's not currently funded by Medicare which is palliative care, and to try to bring palliative care into collaboration with other healthcare providers to get better outcomes in the triple aim. That's what it's all about there with that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick to talk about the data and how to utilize data in developing your strategy in your organization. Thank you, Mark. So um, just wanted to start by giving you a little bit of uh, my background. Um, so I was actually the uh, CFO at Penn Home Care and Hospice Services for a little over seven years and left there in uh, December and came to Trinity. And the reason why I explain that is um, Penn always talks about their mission being uh, research, uh, education, and patient care. And I will 
say that it's my opinion that that's actually their ranking in terms of importance. And so when Mark approached me and said, you know, would you like to participate in this panel? I thought, great. I mean, you know, um, Penn was in a, a bundle and we had all sorts of information. We literally had like a bundle task force. Um, so I thought, this is going to be easy. I'm just going to pull the data. Um, and lo and behold, I leave Penn. So I come um, to Trinity, and uh, Trinity, as the slide shows, is headed by Rick Gilfillan, who is the first director of CMMI. And Rick very passionately believes um, that uh, we, as an organization at Trinity, um, should be uh, engaged in people-centered care. And so we are in a number of the models. And so um, I'll come back to value-based purchasing in a second, but um, what you'll see is that Trinity is in a lot of models. Um, over 300. And so when you talk about data, um, it really does uh, change your perspective when you go from Penn, which really had, you know, I think one or two uh, bundles to the 300. And, and how do you manage that? Um, and what's interesting to me is, you know, kind of looking at the shift, uh, just becomes sort of a, a very existential question is what happens, you know, as Mark talks about his slides, when you start to get to that level of degree where you know you have a very significant percentage of the payments in terms of alternative models, how do you manage it? Um, what's interesting, so you know, in terms of the slides, you'll see you know when you look at the overall cost in terms of the patient care, um, it is considerably below um, what CMS had been paying. The unfortunate thing for Trinity is, at least last fiscal year, and we are doing better this fiscal year. Um, was that it was overall a negative. And in part, just as a reminder, on these bundles, there's a 3% reduction automatically. So um, Trinity reduced the cost, but when you look at what they were paying in terms of the convener and in terms of you know, just their percentage, um, they being CMS, so you know, it wound up being a, a net negative. Um, so our cost was not below that 3% element, and we wound up paying uh, CMS money back. Um, and just to give you some specifics, um, in terms of the bundle, the Model 3, there were three programs. Um, one in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is one of the Trinity Health at Home facilities, um, and then two others in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts, and Sioux City. Um, just to be very clear, those two are Trinity Health, home health agencies, but they are not Trinity Health at Home Home Health Agencies, which is the agency that I work for. Um, what was really neat about the, the initial uh, rollout of this was that Trinity Health as a health system agreed to hold um, Trinity Health at Home harmless for any losses in fiscal year uh, 16. And I apologize, I have a typo there. Uh, it should be that we are responsible at Trinity Health at Home for absorbing any losses in fiscal year 17. Um, and just a quick note, in the aggregate, it's sort of the same uh, trend that Trinity Health had. Um, we lost money in, in uh, 16. We are doing a little bit better in terms of 17, uh, but, you know, again, uh, below what we had budgeted. Um, and just to give you some dollars in terms of uh, the, the dollar amount, you can see that um, of the three programs, one basically was at break even at about $183. One was about $9,600 favorable, and um, one was uh, about $4,200. Um, so a couple of things. You know, Mark talked about data, and there is a ton of data. So I've tried to sort of narrow it down to really the, the important elements. But um, the one thing I would say is um, the number of patients in the episode, and I have a couple of slides that talk about this, really is a, is a huge driver. Um, I, will, I will caution you. When I looked at some of the bundles that we are in, I sort of said to myself, what were they thinking? Because we had relatively low cost and we had relatively good readmission rates. And so if you're going into a bundle where you're going to guarantee at least a 3% reduction in your cost and you're doing really well on your cost, you're setting yourself up for failure. And there were a number of bundles that, you know, we had one or two patients that were outliers that, you know, when you look at our history, we did not have that kind of experience I mean, one of the patients I looked at literally cost $36,000. And you know how much we get paid in terms of Medicare episodes. Um, it was a significant impact to us. So 
certainly one of the things I want everybody to think about is when you're looking at a bundle, you know, how many patients do you have in the bundle and what is your experience in the bundle? And in particular, you know, if CMS starts to roll this out, as Mark said, you know, as a mandatory bundle, how are you going to manage that? And I do think one of the things that CMS is going to have to figure out is how to adjust their payments so that those providers that are good providers that have low cost are not adversely impacted by this. Because again, the way the bundle looks at it is your sort of financial history minus that 3%. So that's one piece in terms of the count of the episodes. Um, the other thing that was really striking to me in terms of looking at the data, and when you look at this, the entire episode readmission rate for our Grand Rapids site was 15.7%. Um, the readmission rate during the home health aid episode was 11.4. So we left and they went back into the hospital shortly thereafter. And how do you manage that? You know, again, one of the things that is really, I think, striking in terms of Trinity Health at Home's performance is we have a relatively low average number of visits per episode. So we're in there, I think we're very efficient in terms of the care we provide, but unfortunately, what usually happens is the patient stabilizes, we discharge the patient, and there's no real follow-up system in place to make sure that those patients don't go back into the hospital. And that wound up costing us as a program. And you know, uh, the reason why I picked the Grand Rapids was you can see you know, here, um, the average cost was elevated in large part because um, you know, the patients wound up having considerable expense after our services were over. So um, just some quick issues in terms of, again, looking at the bundles. You know, bundle selection is obviously very important. Um, bundle Asian population size. And then internal resources. You know, I started talking about Penn. When Penn was there, they had sort of a task force for the bundle, which is great if you have one bundle or two bundles. But when you have 300, it's really hard to have an effective task force. When I started uh, working on the presentation, one of the things that I did was, of course, go to our central intake staff and say, well, how do you identify the patients that are in a bundle? And they literally have like this small binder that says, if you're in this location and this hospital, these are the diagnoses that are you know, in the bundle. I mean, literally dozens of different. Um, and it really becomes problematic in terms of A, uh, making sure that you're identifying the patients correctly. When, um, when I talked to them a little bit further, they said, well, we have a field that we code that says this patient's in a bundle, and I ran it thinking that I would see, I mean, Trinity has about 7,000 patients on service at any given time, you know, really large numbers, and the numbers weren't there. So clearly, we were not identifying uh, the patients effectively. Um, so internal resources is a big issue, and, and as you can see here, in terms of patient identification and really uh, tracking the patients. Um, the availability of the tools to manage the bundles, um, the readmission rate, as I said, in terms of uh, the home health episode versus it. But really, the, the most important thing, and you know, I kind of buried my lead here, as they say in the, the, in the newspaper business, is physician engagement. So this is the slide of our profit and loss uh, by physician. And you can see there are some physicians, um, and it was interesting you know, uh, when you look at the numbers, the, the physicians that we tend to have a lot of bundled patients with also tend to be the physicians that really don't get <coughs> the bundled concept. Um, and so you know, when you look at this, you've got three or four lines where we're losing in excess of 15,000, in some cases 25 and 30,000 dollars on bundle patients coming from specific physicians. So that is an issue. Um, what have we done in terms of trying to manage this? Um, in terms of the model two, I mean, there are a whole list of issues. Obviously, trying to get with the patient navigators um, to engage in the, the care process, identifying the patients and you know, focusing on the, the populations. Participating in uh, daily analysis in terms of the, the populations. Um, really, I think the big thing here, the fourth bullet point, serving as the expert in assessing the patient's needs and ability to meet those patients in the community. Um, you know, how many people uh, still work at, at uh, facilities where the most important uh, determination in terms of getting a referral is how quickly you call back the referral source? 
you know, I mean, there are hospitals where literally their most important thing is if I call you, you need to call, you, call me back in half an hour and take that case. Doesn't matter how good your quality is. Doesn't matter, you know, whether that patient recycles back. Um, it's whether you can take that patient off my hands as quickly as I want you to. Um, and really, you know, when you look at it in terms of collaborating with the facility in terms of a care plan to make sure that the patient, um, when they do come in, you know, whether it's to the hospital or to the ED, um, making sure that there's a plan for them to return home as quickly as possible, and really doing a root cause analysis in terms of those patients. So one of the things that I wanted to point out, you know, just in terms of the bundle, we actually have a sort of a, a quadrant grid here in terms of patients by the site in terms of the utilization and the performance so that we're attempting to kind of focus obviously on those uh, patients in quadrant number one where we have high utilization in terms of the bundle and we're, we're lower performance. Um, and you can see there, there are a number of different sites in terms of this quadrant where uh, we're not performing as well as we would like to. Fortunately, when you look at quadrant two, which is a higher utilization and higher performance, we've, we've got more there. Um, so I have a, a snapshot for each of the different sites that is sort of our, our tracking. Um, you can look here at really the most critical elements that we look at is obviously what is the percentage of patients that are being discharged to a skilled nursing facility? What is the percentage of patients that are being discharged to a home health agency? And what are the percentage of patients who have a readmission? One of the things that has really been striking, you know, when you go back to the physicians and the education, is really getting them to understand that they need to refer the patients to home health. And I think a lot of them feel like this is an extra cost and here it is, a, a bundle. But when you look at the readmission trends in terms of those uh, patients, Patients who don't come on to home health wind up in the hospital more often than not. Um, and it is something, you know, that my executive director, uh, you know, really uh, tries to convey to them on an ongoing basis. Just, you know, if you're not sending us to them, you're just, you know, writing a prescription for the patient to wind up coming back in the hospital. Um, but, you know, again, you can see here one of the things when you look at um, you know, Trinity being a faith-based agency refers to their hospitals as ministries. Um, you know, the total number of episodes, but, you know, one of the most clear uh, metrics that we have is the discharges to the home health aid. And again, you know, what is the home health agency market share? So how many are going um, to the home health agencies that are specified as, as uh, providers? Um, average number of days for the first home health aid visit, obviously, the faster you're out there, the more likely you're be able to intervene successfully, um, and the percentage of home health aid episodes without a readmission. Um, I've added a, a, a number of different ones, um, St. Joseph Mercy here. Um, you can see in terms of just that upper right-hand corner, they have uh, metrics in terms of SNF utilization, so that's a, a red dot, and then also um, you know, home health utilization. So each of these were really intended to show you um, the focus in terms of each of the different um, programs and you know, what emphasis is placed. So um, if we jump back, you'll see here in terms of Mount Carmel, um, Mount Carmel is actually one of the higher utilization, uh, sorry, this is the tier three, the lower utilization, low performing uh, agency. So, um, when you look at this, only about 47 patients in terms of the episodes, whereas the others were in the hundreds. Um, so in terms of uh, tools to success, you know, obviously in terms of alignment, it's been a huge culture shift to get people to really shift um, to overall cost of care and overall patient care rather than just the visits per episode and how quickly can I discharge this patient to get another patient on. Um, the physician engagement, again, is enormous. Um, you know, it would be interesting to see what our profit margins would be if we just had physicians engaged in it. Um, and then one of the struggles that we have, um, you know, the EMR that we're on um, really has limited ability to track the information that we have. And it's been interesting you talk about all the different uh, data discussions. Um, you know, what do you do to try to get the data that you need? And then the last point really, again, you know, is look at your risk tolerance. Um, 
you know, Dr. Gilfillan has been very clear that he feels like this is a the wave of the future, but also what's best for the patient. And you know, Trinity's slogan is you know, patient-centered care or people-centered care. Um, and so they have kind of, you know, dove in uh, to to you know, full steam ahead. I guess would be the best way of saying it. Um, and. There are some things where, you know, they've been in bundles that really, you know, when you look at it again, what I first talked about, there is no chance at success. And I think part of the learning curve is really how do you manage those, those patients where, you know, at best you're going to break even and really, uh, realistically, you're going to expect a loss. Um, the one last thing I did want to talk about in terms of value-based purchasing we have really struggled to get our agencies, and we have two agencies, one in Maryland, one in Iowa, to understand this. Um, you know, I personally think that value-based purchasing is awful um, because you can have two agencies side by side. One improves their quality by 20%, and one improves their quality by 10%, and the 10% agency is going to get a penalty. I mean, when you look at a bundle, a bundle is pretty straightforward. Here's the dollar amount. Meet it or you lose money. Value-based purchasing, you can have great quality and you can have great outcomes, but if the agency down the road is a little bit better than you, you're gonna get hosed, excuse my language. Um, so, you know, it is something that, um, you know, one of the things, you know, it's really kind of the same issues in terms of really what you're trying to focus on, but the outcomes are much less clear to the individuals. Um, you know, when we talked to the people in Maryland, when we realized uh, Maryland is the state where we're going to wind up expecting to pay money back, they had no clue, you know, because what they looked at was a lot of their metrics and they said, you know, we have good metrics. We're doing relatively well. You are, but again, those few percentage points that you're below the agency down the street is really costing you. So, you know, one of the things that I would, I would suggest to you to consider is, you know, how does value-based purchasing rise to the level of scrutiny that BPCI has? Um, and how do you impact that in terms of your staff? So with that, I will turn it over to Paul and he can tell how he incents his staff. Well, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, back some months ago when Mark um, suggested that I join him and Patrick on this type of a uh, presentation. I decided, well, I need to do a little education for myself and my own organization to find out what's been going on uh, within Dignity Health. Dignity Health is a uh, fairly large hospital-based system, uh, 39 hospitals in three states, California here in California, Nevada, and Arizona. And um, last year we had uh, revenue of over uh, $12 billion. We've got 9,000 physicians and over 59,000 employees in the full system. Now, I'm, a, I'm just in the home care section. I'm the director of uh, home care finance uh, for the overall system. Uh, we've got uh, 20 programs plus five partnerships uh, with various responsibilities over those uh, partnerships. Um, some with no management uh, responsibilities over those partnerships. Our home care programs have net revenue of about $155 million uh, this, this uh, past year. And all of our home care programs, I think it's important to know, are primarily <coughs> departments of the hospital. So I'm going to give you the perspective from home care. Now this might actually help you from uh, the perspective of you needing to deal with hospitals and a lot of these bundled uh, care uh, programs, and that's certainly the way I'm going to be presenting uh, this to you. Now, since I really didn't know that much when Mark first uh, approached me with this, I interviewed people within Dignity Health, people that had the responsibilities um, over these bundled uh, projects, so I learned quite a bit in this particular uh, review process. So, um, found out that um, we join primarily the Medicare bundled payments for uh, care improvement. That's the model two, the BPCI uh, model. Uh, we also had um, some participation in the cardiac rehab uh, incentive payment model, the acute myocardial uh, infarction uh, model, and the surgical hip femur fracture treatment model. Now, all, all these are the voluntary uh, type of uh, 
uh, payment reform projects um, out there. Now, what was um, interesting is that um, this was basically pitched to the hospitals. It was not a kind of a mandatory approach because this came from the corporate office. Um, and having the philosophy of approaching each particular hospital with the option of joining these voluntary programs or not uh, proved to be, had some interesting dynamics. Now, not every hospital had a, um, and still does not have a home care program, so to speak, or, or, or many other uh, post-acute care uh, facilities. So if they were going to get into these particular uh, programs, they had to figure out, well, what are you going to do about post-acute care? How are you going to handle that? So uh, from the perspective of the home health agency that might be connected to the hospital, they had to figure out basically how are they going to be used and, and how it would be integrated with the whole kind of approach. But some of the basic interests here in the participation area I have in this particular list, that's the opportunity for, for better outcomes, uh, the opportunity for, for better quality, um, the opportunity for a better cost uh, containment or cost management uh, was all there. Uh, Value-based purchasing links uh, payment for the uh, per performance uh, was certainly of interest. Uh, staff working together to meet these incentives. Um, so with all of that, Dignity Health actually ended up uh, contracting with an outside company called Nava Health to oversee this, all of these programs and projects as a convener. So one of the uh, first thing uh, that uh, NAB Health did is actually approach, even from a, kind of like a marketing approach, to all of the hospitals. They, they visited every hospital, every one of the 39 hospitals, and gave them the pitch about these, this uh, bundled payment uh, program and whether or not they wanted to uh, get into this voluntary uh, program. So hospital presidents, the boards, the leaders, all reviewed the pros and cons of participating um, in this particular uh, program. And each hospital had the option of saying yes or no to these particular uh, uh, programs. And you know, I think a little bit of the uh, decision making was whether or not they had a home care program there. And they actually, uh, it was interesting from our perspective on the home care side is that you know, some of them I think barely paid much attention to us in, in home health. So, so we began to finally get some attention. Now, when we became finally aware that Dignity Health was getting into this, we invited, the home care group invited Nava Health to come and speak to us. We have um, annual on-site meetings in San Francisco where our headquarters is. So we, we invited Nava Health to come and speak to us and, and tell us, you know, what do we need to do as home care providers to uh, get ready for our hospitals to participate in this? And they gave us some, I think, great information. And it, it, quite frankly, it, it incentivized us to be better at what we were doing. Um, because we found out, and, and Nava Health told us how they're going to decide on even what home health agencies and what skilled nursing facilities they're, they're going to use. So they did want to look at uh, old historical claims data. And they wanted to look at quality. So the, the star ratings became a very large factor in how they were going to decide in the use of our own home health agency versus others that are in the market. And then we have a lot of competitors in our markets. So uh, that certainly became a very large incentive for us in home health to do uh, better, to show improvement in our star ratings, uh, in reimbursement. Uh, we had lots of facts and figures on the data about uh, what, what kind of um, outcomes and even utilization rates on Medicare episodes that we had and so on. So um, it, we started kind of a, our own kind of game plan on the home care side uh, uh, with that. In the meantime, uh, 30 hospitals began participating in this particular uh, program. And um, they have this selection criteria in this particular program where they can choose episode types of what they want to participate in. So that's, that's basic, basic types of episode uh, uh, or qualifiers for the patients and becoming and putting into this in their particular model. So there was actually a range. Of, of, of one, the only one facility only chose one type of episode and another one chose up to 19. So part of the incentive was, well, with all of this information we got from NABA Health as to what our historical data looked like, um, we could probably do some improvements. Maybe we can make some money 
because uh, although it's certainly a large incentive for on a financial perspective, and they chose up to 19, at least one facility did. So that was part of the, the motivating factor. Here's a little list of the pros and cons that I learned about in the interviews that I uh, conducted. Just to gain experience in the, few, uh, the future payment models uh, was certainly a, a, a high one on the list. Establishing a financial accountability for uh, quality care, that was not much of an incentive before, but with this new model perspective, it certainly became one. The opportunity to improve care coordination internally and externally with post-acute care providers. Now this became a big one. Uh, when we got into this, uh, learned uh, about some you know, relationship issues between home health and care coordination or discharge planning in, among the facilities. So we started some programs to improve that care coordination communication. Um, and based upon some of the, uh, the factors that NavaHealth started using, um, you know, a couple of our own home care agencies were not even considered qualified. Uh, we had a couple at a three-star rating, uh, uh, for example, and they had to improve up to at least three and a half in order to be con considered uh, to be even uh, uh, receiving uh, discharge uh, or referrals uh, within their own facility. So um, NavHealth set that goal. Uh, you have to have at least a three and a half star rating and you had to have a certain um, uh, uh, expectation in terms of utilization uh, reviews. They also even looked at cost reports, by the way, just to look at the cost of agencies, which I thought was interesting. So it also um, approved, um, uh, there was a promoted um, uh, positive culture change with this. Um, waiver of, there was a waiver of geographical re requirement for the telehealth reimbursement. Uh, became a little bit of a fact. We didn't use actually much of that, but it did become an element of a, of a positive uh, factor in just looking at it. Opportunity for other payers, just learning how these models worked and possibly uh, using similar models with other uh, large groups of uh, third-party payers. Uh, and we did uh, find that useful in a few uh, of the markets in Northern uh, California where we were able to adopt similar types of programs. Uh, the potential of the financial gains in, in a shared savings. In the beginning of our contract with NavHealth, for example, um, they were not, they did not have a built-in incentive uh, to actually show financial gains uh, in their contract, but it was built in later. Uh, leadership decided to put that incentive into the NavHealth contract so that they were then incentivized to make sure that they could even share in the sh any shared savings that there might be coming to, to the various um, hospitals. So that was kind of interesting. Um, among the cons, uh, obtaining um, stakeholder buy-in. Um, just kind of selling the idea uh, was uh, sometimes negative for uh, some of the findings. Um, incentivizing post-acute care providers. Uh, we, as I was just talking about, it created kind of our own incentives just because we wanted to get the referrals and not give them to our own competitors. But we were on this equal playing field now, uh, probably more uh, with this program than even before. Um, a lack of other payer uh, participation, having dual systems. So because it was, it was very different than how we're getting paid by other payers, um, that became a little bit of a negative. Uh, greater uh, management complexity, just because you're managing uh, things differently um, and had to have kind of a, a dual system uh, for that as well uh, was a little bit of a con. Uh, greater reporting responsibility. So we would be getting quite a bit of reports from NavaHealth and they would be using uh, basically claims information so that every four or five months or so we'd get a, you know, a listing of all kinds of reports to show how each facility is doing. Um, and where improvement be need, needed to be made and then the hospitals would have to decide you know, what kind of uh, additional resources, if any, uh, needed to go into that. Um, I heard a lot about um, provider fatigue, you know, just kind of in a sense getting burned out from some of this because it was so new, it was so different, very, very specialized, so a bit of a negative there. Um, and potential uh, financial losses if the cost is higher. So certainly that became um, into um, uh, uh, a review and um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, how it came out. 
Um, many of the participants chose Model 2, and uh, one of the primary reasons was that it included um, post-acute care, care providers in that bundle. So we got more involved. There was actually a brand new uh, senior director of post-acute care hired into the system, and she became the one primarily responsible for that. So for, for a very long time, and even now, she became, uh, we became great friends just to be able to make this work on the uh, home health and, and uh, hospice side. So uh, that became, very, I think, very, very positive. Um, so it, all of that helped increase the opportunity to reduce costs, so we're, we're continuing to certainly work on those particular factors. Um, and by maintaining the fee-for-service payments in the PAC greatly uh, uh, minimized the risk to the hospitals uh, became very important. Um, there was less need for infrastructure changes uh, due to this and greater opportunity for early, earlier discharges to the PAC. So we did see some increased business in a few of the markets uh, just because of the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the need for earlier discharge. So it, put, it put, did put greater emphasis on that. But we were also seeing in other markets that we were losing some business. We weren't getting as many referrals as we could. So again, that increased the incentive for us to just do a better job and then let people know that we were doing a better job and that our quality increased. Uh, so we would be reaching out more to the care coordination team as a result of that. Um, and it helped to have th these monitoring reports, um, you know, come out so that we'd be at the same table with care coordination and the, and the management as well so that we could uh, solve problems <coughs> and improve the performance all the way around. Uh, so I wanted to uh, share a few things here about some of the uh, models that we uh, uh, have been involved with and still are uh, to a large respect. That's the coronary area by bypass graph model. So th these are the details of this particular model. Uh, bundles payments for items and services related uh, to this uh, treatment and recovery. It actually begins with the hospital admission and extends for 90 days after the hospital discharge. Um, in 98 geographical areas, and not as many of our hospitals join this particular model, but we do have a few. So again, this is something that we are watching uh, very, very closely and watching to see how home health and hospice are, are involved. Uh, we don't have very many hospices, but they have been included in a couple of the markets here to, uh, to watch that very uh, carefully. Uh, the model has uh, built-in quality incentives involving uh, the mortality rate and the HCAPS uh, scores as well. Um, and there's a, certainly a very strong incentive to avoid the <coughs> expensive and harmful effects uh, to help reduce those costs. So CMS provides tools which we are using to assist in that particular care coordination. And again, this is all coordinated with the outside organization that we've hired, NAVA Health. Uh, then we have the acute myocardial diffraction model. Uh, details are very similar. Um, again, these, these are bundled payments for items and services related to the AMI treatment and recovery. Again, it, it begins with the hospital admission and extends for 90 days. Again, it's 98 geographical areas. What's interesting, even among these particular models, not all hospitals kind of chose the same um, uh, projects here. So there's, there's a little bit of variety. Again, it was like Navihel gave the pitch to all the hospitals and just a few chose these uh, that they were, they thought they could actually gain some, some insight into you know, how they're doing, what they need to do, how do they need to improve. So those are the incentives um, that was analyzed uh, for each of these particular um, areas. So, but that financial possible gain was certainly or, or always there um, and very um, attractive but certainly didn't always uh, come out to, to play. And the surgical hip and femur fracture uh, treatment model details, very, very similar. Uh, bundled payments for the um, items and services related to uh, the treatment and recovery. Uh, again, that also uh, begins with the hospital admission and extends for 90 days after the hospital discharge. This one only affected 67 areas. I think we've got one hospital in this one. Uh, the hospital must attain a certain quality level before any reconciliation payments are made. 
and higher payments are made with higher improvements in quality. Um, so this one is also using uh, home health primary, but not hospice. Um, so again, this is very, very individualized that NaviHealth is, is watching, and we're watching it very closely too from a uh, um, kind of a, a home care or a PAC perspective. So the um, initial results in Dignity Health, um, as I mentioned, we conducted um, interviews. Um, with all of the, uh, the major stakeholders. Um, and I talked to both finance people and, and clinical people. Now I, I tell you from the uh, financial perspective, um, the, the finance CFOs types were very disappointed with the results. And I think there was just so many um, areas uh, of, of learning. Uh, people did not realize what some of the, the <coughs> negatives could be. And some of those negatives created a lot of workarounds that became a little bit expensive. And I think that's primarily why. So it, lots of room for lessons to be learned. But on the clinical side, they, they feel actually very good about these programs and still do and are looking forward to even being able to improve in these particular projects. So their incentives are very high. They uh, strongly believe that they've increased the quality, they've helped reduce admissions and so on, um, and helping to train staff and get ready basically for the future, I think have been very strong incentives uh, for the, the clinical side. So um, I, I think uh, we're certainly been put into, a, let's say, a better position today with having these experiences. So and, and my part on the home care side will certainly will be to uh, help improve, you know, not only the quality, but uh, utilization reviews and so on um, among our, our home health agencies. So we have a number of areas that we're going to be working on. Um, to help the, the system, you know, achieve better results here overall. So with that, I think we can turn it over to some Q&A. Any questions? You guys are ready for that drink, huh? No questions at all? Yes. Did you find that your clinicians started practicing differently for Bundled populations versus non-bundled, or did some of the spillover come into the non-bundled population? Is this on? Yeah. Um, I think yes, definitely. I, I think because of the feedback clinicians were getting about this program and the push on better quality, just because we got more attention, I think, also had an effect. So definitely more emphasis on the bundled portion of it, but I think it did. Uh, really improve the overall quality of all patients. And, and how about that, when you think about the um, morale of the home care business, did it impact that overall? It, it improved the morale. And again, because we were getting more attention, you know, in a very large acute-based system, you know, we're, we're, we're typically the stepchild, you know, of, of the system. Hard to get IT funding and, and different uh, projects kind of rolled out. I mean, so often we say, oh, your project's got to be put on hold because XYZ hospitals are doing this, and it's very difficult to get resources. But now that we have this additional attention, they can see the value of home care. That's been very positive. So I think for Trinity, it's been kind of a mixed bag in the sense that um, the additional attention has brought some additional scrutiny in terms of just you know, uh, elements. So, you know, the time to admit patients um, has been a big focal point. And I think, you know, um, the clinical staff had not been as focused on that. Um, and so now all of a sudden it brings a level of urgency that they were not used to. I think to, to Paul's point, I think it has been very positive in terms of the culture to say, you know, again, the, this is people-centered care and we're focused on the patient and it gives them sort of the latitude to speak up, you know, whereas I think before they might have felt pressured like, okay, you know, move on to the next patient. They can say, all right, hang on, we got to stop. We need to do something so that this patient. Um, so in some regards, it's been definitely positive, but on other regards in terms of just, you know, hitting these metrics, I think it's created, you know, uh, a level of urgency that wasn't there. And I would also make the point that there's sort of a ripple effect. I mean, you know, HR is under the gun now to make sure that we have the appropriate staffing levels. And, you know, that position that before could have sat out there for, 
you know, 30 days without somebody saying what's going on. I mean, that, that's no longer uh, realistic. I mean, if we haven't filled a position, you know, that question goes over to HR pretty much every day. What's going on? We need nurses here. Or we need therapists here. And, and you know, it's uh, brought a level of urgency across the And, the and as the uh, <clears throat> non-provider up here, um, I heard repet uh, repeatedly him say, urgency over the 17 years of PPS in home health I'd say especially the first 12 years or so pretty darn good in home health and we really haven't had that em emphasis of urgency from my perspective and when you talk about what SNFs are dealing with in this landscape SNFs the triple aim is so counterintuitive to their payment model under fee-for-service. I would suggest to you, I might hear some of you argue with me, that if you're trying to achieve the triple aim in home health, it can be the winning solution and the winning answer in both fee-for-service and for the bundles and the value-based purchasing. That's my perspective. but. Um, where it's very different for SNFs. So I, I, I think I, I, I um, recall you saying that um, that in, in, in the models that you were describing that they were hospital-based home, home care agents pretty much, right? Department of hospital. So you know, given the importance of clinical integration and making these bundles work, to what extent was the fact that they were hospital-based um, a, a, a factor, and also, you know, the fact that as hospital based, perhaps there was an advantage with technological integration. Can you just comment on that? And then, just the last part of it being that if you had to do it with freestanding agencies, um, what would have been the relative burden? Well, in our um, model here with Dignity Health, you know, Nava Health told us right up front you're going to compete with everybody else in your market. Freestanding, hospital-based, we don't care. So it was an equal playing field from their perspective. They wanted the best uh, home care, the best SNFs for this project, okay? So we had to compete on that equal playing field. So, and and Nava Health had some control over where these referrals went. So that was a little frightening to the home care folks. You know, and so that's what kind of, that was that incentive for, for us in the home care side. So, but not every hospital system might be certainly approaching this. I don't know what Patrick's perspective is, but that's, that was our experience in, in Dignity Health. We had a, a similar experience and, you know, I think one of the, the major drivers was, you know, again, when you're looking at Model 2, it's the health system, it's the hospitals that uh, incur the financial penalty. Um, you know, so they are motivated to make sure that they get the outcomes that they want. Um, I don't know specifically with our convener, which is Remedy, but I do think that to some degree that there is probably an incentive payment for the convener to make sure that they hit their targets as well. Because, you know, again, one of the things when you look at Trinity last year, um, Trinity lost money on the bundles. And again, the cost of care was lower but between what CMS paid or took in terms of the percentage and what uh, Trinity paid um, remedy, you know, they lost money. So there's, there's definitely a big incentive there. The one thing I will say is that, you know, in terms of being a hospital base versus a freestanding, there's a lot more um, sort of insider information in terms of, hey, this is what we want you to focus on, you know, whereas I think you know, with the, the freestanding, they seemed a little bit disengaged. It was like, okay, you have your patient, it's a bundled patient. You know, again, you know, we do root cause analysis if a patient goes back into the hospital, and I think the advantage is that, you know, you're right down the, the hallway, and so they have that conversation with you, where I, I would doubt, and I don't know for sure, but I would doubt that that level of intensity is with the freestanding. But again, you know, um, Trinity didn't really care who was the provider. It was just what your outcomes were. And, and I would even say, just real quick, um, first of all, there's only about 1,200, 1,500 
hospital-based agencies in the country, there's another 10,000, 12, or 11,000 freestanding agencies. It's not going to be all about the hospital-based agencies. And yeah. as a matter of fact, today I was sitting down with somebody that runs a hospital-based program, and that person is charged with finding other agencies to collaborate with that are freestanding. Um, so uh, it's, it's not all just uh, that I would suggest hospital-based have the advantage. But, go ahead. I have a question for Patrick. Um, we, um, we went to single awardee, okay? We mm -hmm. had a convener. Mm -hmm. We went to single awardee um, for our Model 3, okay? Uh, aside for the, uh, if, if you didn't have, what do you think the benefit if, and the admin fee? I know all about that yeah. and the data and the analytics. If you have the capacity now to do the data and analytics, <coughs> would it have been a bit better? Um, would it have been a better um, outcome in some of the areas? You know, I I don't think so. I think you know again um, physician uh, participation, but I also think you know when you look at some of the. Um, populations that we serve one you know they're just too small you have one yeah. uh, you know one patient who's an outlier and it would just kill you um, and you know also I think you know to Mark's point um, we are in a building and uh, you know I apologize Trinity has rebranded everything and I don't know the title for sure but I think it's Trinity Health Senior Communities is their nursing home arm is upstairs and, you know, you just hear, you know, on a regular basis that they're just getting hammered. I mean, their occupancy rate is probably 6% below where it was two years ago, and they're, they're really struggling. So I do think, you know, a lot of the bundles where you have the savings, to Mark's point, is reducing SNF. Um, it's been very hard to, to really manage, you know, the level three where you're, and Trinity, and I didn't uh, touch base too much on this, but they have uh, 13 level threes that are SNF based. Um, so they're, they're doing that. But the home health ones is really just primarily focused on home health, and, and we lost money on those. And, and, and I think it's hard to make money on those. Yeah. So this is Uh, yes, uh, and the positive basically was again getting the attention. Um, we we knew based upon what Nava Health criteria was going to be for making referrals that we needed to have closer ties to our own care coordination departments on the hospital. So we actually spent some time and effort to to find out well why aren't we getting let's say even more referrals. And sometimes it's just poor communication. So we found the issues. We put work into finding the issues and trying to solve those issues. Sometimes that just meant having a meeting and having a meeting with some of the leadership in that particular hospital. And the senior director of post-acute care that I mentioned about hiring, and she has, has been here now about a year and a half, uh, she's helped coordinate some of those meetings. So it was that link that helped in that whole area. So it's, we've definitely seen some improvement because of that. Any other questions? We're about nine minutes over, so thanks for bearing with us and uh, participating. Have a good rest of the evening. <laughs>